today I have two goals. Um, one is uh, I'm going to, in the first half, I'm going to uh, give you a bit of a slightly historical uh, progress to Kilosort um, to focus on the main algorithms. Uh, some of them uh, have been around since I started working on this from the beginning and haven't changed, like the template matching part. Um, they're really kind of core to uh, how the pipeline works. And so it's, it's uh, good to understand how, how, how that works. Uh, and then my second goal in the second half will be to um, take you to some of the most recent developments in what I now call for now Kilosor 2.5, um, which is where really the, the new updates um, are. This is like not really released yet, but will be uh, very shortly um, together with the NeuroPixels 2.0 paper. And so, um, of course, please stop me at any time. Any question that you might have might, of course, be a question that others have as well. And so I, I'd be very happy to answer questions uh, as we go along, um, as well as afterwards. Uh, I can't stay afterwards, but uh, please reach out to me, um, whether on the GitHub page of, of, of Kilosort or, or directly um, to ask me about your, your, all of your spike sorting questions. Uh, and here are some of the people that have helped at um, various points on this, especially recently, uh, as we've been kind of increasing our operation, uh, you know, moving Kilosort to Python. It's been, it's still mostly a, a MATLAB-based uh, program. Um, as we've looked at different kinds of data to uh, make sure it, it works for a lot of people, um, and, and, and as we've uh, analyzed uh, and quantified how well it works. So I don't think I need to tell you why we need automated spike sorting. Uh, probably already up to speed from, from Nick and others here. Um, but I'll tell you one of the, the biggest things that, that really motivated us to, um, to work on this um, from the beginning, really, but uh, even as recently as, as a few years ago when uh, Nick, um, with his um, skills, has, was, was doing these eight probe neuropixel recordings uh, at a time when you know a lot of people were 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 still um, getting just getting uh, neuropixels probes. Um, this is a very hard experiment. It produces a lot of data. Um, a picture like this on the right shows you the spikes from neurons on all these eight probes recorded simultaneously. Um, and of course, you don't want to uh, spend your time manually uh, spike sorting uh, this data. You want to have an algorithm as automated as possible um, so that you can get right to the science, which is going to be really interesting with these kinds of A-probe recordings, um, as, it, as it turned out. And so, um, yeah, let me skip uh, through that. Um, I'm going to mostly be walking you through Kilosort um, by pointing to pictures that you'll be seeing if you run the algorithm yourselves, um, or if you look at the results of the algorithm in um, the GUI called Phi uh, that um, takes closer <coughs> outputs and um, allows you to look at it in all sorts of different ways and indeed manually curate the data if you need to. But the first picture that you'll likely see when you start Kilosort is going to be this one. This is a MATLAB-based GUI that uh, allows you to kind of set up uh, a Kilosort run with, with various parameters they're very small here on the left. Uh, I'm not going to right now step you through what all these parameters mean, um, but basically this this provides like a, a very reduced uh, uh, file-like functionality uh, just to allow you to kind of see some picture of your raw data here on the right. This is this is a picture. You can also look at traces. Uh, I should say Nick has has developed this uh, this GUI in MATLAB. Um, you can see the, the picture, it shows all 384 or maybe 74 in this case sites. Um, and it's a, it's a color map, red means uh, a negative deflection, uh, black means a positive deflection. Um, and if you're looking at raw data like this and, and you've looked at it for a while, you kind of start picking out where the spikes are. Um, you get a sense that there's there's a great agglomeration of, of spikes and, and lots of overlaps, uh, especially within this period of the recording. 
Um, of course, some periods will be more silent than others, and you might not have as, as much of a problem with overlaps. Um, but at least just, just kind of firing it up uh, and loading the data, you get a sense that the data was loaded correctly. Um, and so in principle, you could just press run all, the algorithm would run, um, and it would give you access to a few other views. Um, here's again, the, the data view. Um, and now here's another view uh, that you get right away, um, which is the pre-processed version of the data. I'm gonna go into more detail about what the pre-processing entails, but one of the things you'll be doing a lot is just kind of going back and forth like this, which I hope you, you get over Zoom, um, to get a sense of, of what you know, the different steps of, of the algorithm are doing. In this case, you can see that the, the, the spatial temporal filtering at the top there. Now I should move this because it's over my title, huh? Put it there. Probably not in this spot there. All right. So after spatial temporal filtering, uh, you got a sense that um, a lot of this kind of widely spread voltages have been kind of uh, greatly localized in time and space. So essentially, the spatial temporal filtering is going to remove a lot of the correlations in time and space. We'll come back to show exactly how. After you run the algorithm, you get a reconstruction of the raw data uh, with templates that the algorithm identified as corresponding to different neurons at different times. Um, and it's generally optimized the layout of these templates and their positioning so as to reconstruct this um, raw data as well as possible. And this kind of reconstruction is at the core of template matching algorithms. It's at the core of the cost function that, that Kilosort um, and other algorithms really uh, these days optimize. And so we'll get to that step in more detail too. Um, again, you can, you, you'll be able to see this exact plot in the GUI for your data. Uh, and you'll also be able to see this plot, which is the residual of the reconstruction. In other words, if I subtract the reconstruction from the raw data, um, what is what is left? Um, and this is useful for picking out, for example, when the algorithm doesn't work so well, it might leave stuff in this residual that you might identify as uh, spikes from neurons that weren't captured perhaps, or you know maybe something weird has, has happened. Um, you know, like you'll, you'll, in the GUI, you'll be able to zoom in and look more closely. Um, you know, sometimes you might have to um, look at individual events, see exactly how the kind of subtraction worked. Um, you'll get those kinds of views in, in Phi as well. Um, those are kind of some of the more advanced things that, that you can do once you get a sense of, of how the algorithm works and, and when it doesn't work. So here's now the, the pipeline. Um, there are essentially four steps. There's some amount of pre-processing that we do. There's some amount of post-processing that we do. And there's the kind of core of the algorithm, which includes a clustering step and a template matching step. In Kilosort, at currently, um, and, and actually always, these two have been combined into kind of a single unified framework that does clustering and spike extraction or spike detection at the same time uh, and template matching. Uh, so it's all one cost function, one optimization that does both of these steps. Um, however, for the purposes of, of, of the presentation today, I, I, I will be treating them separately because they kind of each have their separate caveats or, or problems that one needs to be aware uh, in trying to determine why the algorithm might be failing or, or why it's working. So pre-processing um, involves now primarily two steps. The one I've just shown you, the spatial temporal filtering. Well, that's, that's the easy part, actually. It's been there since the beginning, since Kilosort 1. Uh, and then there's the drift correction step that corrects for a vertical motion of the probe. Um, throughout time. It has, that has been one of the, the main things I've really been working on uh, in Kilosort to, to update it over the past several years. We had a version of this in Kilosort 2. We have a completely different version in, in 2.5. Um, and so I will in fact only tell you about the 2.5 version uh, and that will be the last thing we discuss today. Now, 
for um, for clustering, um, it is important um, to keep in mind that the kilo sort and any spike sorter has all the typical problems that a clustering algorithm has, uh, which is uh, you know it's not it it can uh, have local minima. Clustering is this you know unsupervised learning problem. Um, you know it has lots of versions. You know k-means is the simplest form of clustering. You might all be familiar with. Uh, just trying to group spikes into clusters uh, can be very, very prone to local minima. And by local minima of the cost function, I mean just imperfect solutions. Solutions in which, for example, some uh, neurons may have been merged or a neuron may have been split into two parts uh, and we need to, to merge it back. Um, and so there's been all sorts of tricks that, that we've had from the beginning to deal with this kind of problem. One of them is to initialize the clusters well. We have a, a, a new method to do that in KiloSort 2. Uh, another one is to account for some of the variability between a, within a cluster with an amplitude model of, of how the amplitude of each spike's shape kind of scales. Uh, and then really to have these kinds of fairly ad hoc split and merge steps where we literally test any kind of pairs of neurons. Uh, we look at, see if we can merge them. We, we see if we can split neurons. Uh, and we do this quite, um, quite a lot. Uh, we do it either both within the clustering process itself as the optimization um, goes on, and we do it at the end in, in the post-processing step, as, as you'll see in a moment. Template matching is, is this step that um, I will describe shortly. Um, it, once you have the uh, templates or waveforms for each neuron, you go back to the raw data, you use the templates to extract spikes, determine where they are. And the main advantage of it um, over, over kind of a more standard approach of detecting spikes first is that it can resolve spike overlaps. Uh, so whenever two neurons fire next to each other in space and time, that can be difficult to resolve with a standard threshold, um, threshold crossing algorithm. Uh, and that's where template matching can, can really help us. As I said, in post-processing, there's splits and merges, just like similar really to the ones we do during clustering, but just a little bit more fancy because we don't have to do them all the time. We just do them once and we're done. Um, and then we have a, a step of, of classifying these units. So uh, the final result of the algorithm, um, normally you might have, you might go yourself into uh, phi after you run a kilo sort, and look and kind of classify units as good multi-unit activity or noise. Um, some of that, um, most of it really might, uh, these days might be done well by um, automated classifiers um, that, that include neural networks and um, other approaches like that. And so to start with, with, with the Marius, core- sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sit You're taking questions, right? Um, hi. Um, there's one question asking, how do you know if the sorting results are good or bad based on the residuals? Uh, so you can't tell based on the residuals alone. Uh, it's just one other source of information that, that you have. Um, in fact, you know, most of what uh, you're going to get in the practical spike sorting session is to try to determine if the sorting results are good or bad. Uh, and in doing that, you will be incorporated in lots of different uh, sources of information. The residuals are just one such source. Um, and in particular, uh, you want to look in the residuals to see if there's any spikes that have been missed for any reason. If, if your eye can pick out things in the residual and the, the algorithm didn't pick them, then for example, you might wanna lower some of the thresholds in the algorithm to kind of allow it to, um, to take more of the of those spikes. Great. Um, more questions, but maybe you talk about this about the computer capabilities you need for the sorting. Yeah. Well, I wasn't really going to talk about it. I didn't say that you need a graphical uh, processing unit, so a GPU. Um, I can I drop think... a link to that page that uh, you wrote, Marius, about computer requirements. Right. Good. Uh, yeah. There... yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. There's a GitHub page that goes into great detail um, but it's really just uh, just a basic gamer computer would be enough um, essentially uh, because those have the the fancy gpus and you don't need a lot of cpu power um, 
you need a moderate amount of RAM. But most people that use KiloSort, you know, build their workstation specifically for KiloSort. You don't need compute clusters or, or anything of that sort. Good, thanks, Sylvia, and keep relaying those uh, questions. Um, now let's talk about the core of the algorithm. So this this part that I told you has has stayed unchanged since uh, essentially since 2016. Now we've we've covered pre-processing. You know, there's some high pass filtering at 300 hertz. Um, why 300 hertz? Well, because spikes are about one or two milliseconds. So you know, 300 hertz corresponds to a period of about three milliseconds. So if you high pass filter like that, it won't throw out the spikes. It will modify them a little bit, their, their shapes. Um, this is something you'll learn to recognize uh, when you look in Phi afterwards at templates versus raw waveforms. There'll be some differences there. Um, but really, 300 hertz should be safe. It will kind of throw out uh, background fluctuations. Um, LFP, now depending on what NeuroPixels probe you, you're using, uh, I guess the standard ones now uh, have a separate band for LFP and action potentials. Still, you know, there's going to be some spillover um, into the action potential band. There'll be some higher frequency fluctuations uh, in there as well that you'll be able to throw out uh, with this high test filtering. And the second important part, and it, it's really, it's, it's equally important, just the same way that we filter across time, we have to filter across space uh, to really reduce the, the footprint that some of these, you know, background events have. Um, you know, when a background event is not really a single spike or when it's a spike from, I don't know, a cluster of neurons far away, um, then it will almost always go away um, if we're able to uh, essentially filter across channels, uh, removing correlations. This operation is known as whitening. Um, you can go into the mathematical details of, of that to really understand how it works, but it's, it's I would describe it that very, I think it's described very well by thinking of it as a spatial filtering. Um, and can you change the high pass filter? You can, sure, yes. Most of the, yeah, so if you remember that, that GUI, that, that's the first thing you see in KiloSort, uh, the parameters that have been exposed here in the GUI are the ones that we think make the most difference when, when you're doing spike sorting. So they're the ones that we might, I would encourage you to try changing uh, to see how the results change. Uh, there's also a lot of other parameters underneath the hood that, that you could, in principle, change uh, to see, you know, I would call those more advanced parameters, just because, and they're advanced not just because they may have complex effects, but also because um, the, uh, it might be subtle what, what the changes are uh, when you change the, the high test filtering. Okay, right, so that was the pre-processing part. Okay, this is really the main part, the, the template matching. So let's um, assume for a moment uh, that we know exactly what the average waveforms are for every neuron. So, you know, through some clustering process, we have kind of gotten to this stage where we know for every neuron what it should look like. And here's some examples uh, in, in, in two rows of neurons. And so we want to be able to use these kinds of signatures, these spatiotemporal signatures of every neuron to detect exactly when it is spiking in any one chunk of data. And so, well, I guess this is a little confusing here because I'm showing traces on the top and an image on the bottom, but you know, we, you, we, it, it, it's good to go back and forth between thinking of them as, as traces and images. Uh, it's perhaps even more clear if you look at it as, as an image that um, you, know, you need to use a template and match it to the image at the precise position where a neuron might be firing. So you know, if we have I don't know, this kind of template for this neuron here, uh, what we'll be doing is swiping the template across the entire time course. This is a convolutional operation in time where we swipe the template, we multiply it with the raw data well, with the filter data, actually, not raw. Uh, and we see where does this template kind of have a, a great activation? Uh, where does that dot product um, really stand out from, from the background? 
Um, and that's where we find our template matches. And we go in an iterative fashion with all of the templates, kind of, if you want, simultaneously across this, this entire data and across channels and time, um, we find the best matches in a kind of greedy iterative fashion. And by best matches, I mean matches that, you know, go by the largest neuron first. So, you know, some of these neurons are over many channels, may have big amplitudes. Those will generate big uh, kind of impulse responses in their corresponding template, and they'll be picked out first. And once they get picked out, the next thing we do is we subtract off that template from the raw data to make sure we can't pick it up again. Um, and once we subtract it off, we can go to the next big, biggest match, uh, which you know might be somewhere else in this data, or or might be somewhere very close to where we just subtracted a template. Uh, and then we find another match there, we subtract that off, and so on. And this is done iteratively uh, in order of amplitude. And because of this, because of this iterative and subtractive fashion, an algorithm known as matching pursuit. Uh, we're able to, you know, resolve spikes even when they're fairly close to each other. So, because at any step that that we pick out the spike, we've kind of subtracted off already the biggest things around it. And that's the essence of this template matching algorithm, and it's the reason why um, it allows us to to find overlapping spikes. Now. What I described to you just now in kind of fairly informal terms um, is in fact has a, a strict mathematical formulation coming from this kind of model. Um, it's a model that allows you to both, in fact, learn the templates. So, because of course no one gives us the templates, no one tells us what the neurons should look like. Uh, and it allows us to do the spike inference that, that I just described. And so it's good to understand this the simple equation. Um, it's uh, essentially, it models uh, this voltage. The voltage is a matrix, a two-dimensional matrix. It's an image. It has two coordinates, the electrode or depth and time, right? So it's, it's a matrix like that. This is the data pre-processed. And we want to reconstruct this data, that's the equality sign here, uh, from this model that takes some kind of spike templates. These are the A's, the spike templates. And for every spike, so K here is uh, iterating over spikes. For every spike, we want to assign it to a cluster. That's this function, sigma of K assigns it the spike to a cluster, zero, one, two, three, four, whatever. We take for that cluster, we take its template, we place it at the specific channel Z at, and time points, you know, in relation to TK, the time of the spike. We place that template there uh, at the time of, of that spike multiplied by some amplitude um, that is kind of centered around the mean amplitude for this neuron, but has some kind of uh, distribution. Uh, and then there's gonna be some background noise uh, that we take into account. And essentially, if you are optimizing a cost function that subtracts the left-hand side from the right-hand side, kind of with a mean squared error term, uh, then you arrive at the inference algorithm that uh, I've, I've described on the previous slide, that the template matching part. And in addition to that, and that's where this unified model comes in, uh, after you've done your spike inference, you might say, well, okay, but A is also a parameter of this model. I can also optimize for A, the templates. So, if I can make the templates agree a little bit better with the kind of waveforms that, that we've just seen, that we've just assigned, then the model is gonna be better. And so we optimize the A's given the X's. And now that we've optimized the A's, well, we can fix the A's and go back and do spike inference again. And we can do this iteratively in a kind of coordinate descent or um, EM style optimization algorithm to jointly optimize the best shapes for the neurons and the times at which uh, those shapes occur in the, in the uh, voltage in the data. All right, so that's, that's really the, the core of how uh, Kilosort and uh, many other algorithms work. 
it's one of the things that has allowed us to, as I said, um, miss fewer spikes because we there was with with some of the previous algorithms, um, it was easy to miss spikes when those spikes were overlapping with other spikes, and so. I just want to bring up this quantification here. Um, this is just comparing kilosort and, and clusterquick, uh, an older algorithm. Um, what you can see is in terms of you know, false positive rates, they're really not that different. Uh, it's really in the miss rates where you can see kilosort can find a lot more neurons at lower miss rates uh, compared to uh, clusterquick. And then for some neurons, you know, these last 200 here, neither of the algorithm is really you know, able to uh, to do well on, uh, but this is a an old benchmark from 2016. Um, things have gotten better since then. Um, this is just uh, another uh, comparison with from around the same time. In fact, uh, also comparing lots of algorithms, and all of these. Well, not all of these, but you know, triad class has gotten better. Spiking circuit has gotten better, and so has kilosort. Um, but I still like to show this slide because it really contrasts the algorithms that have template matching, spiking circuits and kilosort, with these ones that, that don't, that have to start with threshold crossings to, to get their spikes. So they, they can't resolve overlapping spikes because of that. And then when you quantify their performance, you see they have a lot more misses on the order of 8% of or so uh, compared to um, near zero for template matching based algorithms. So that's the essence of, of template matching. Uh, and I've shown you some quantifications of, of, of how we know that the algorithms are doing well or not doing well. Um, we have all sorts of kind of simulations, hybrid ground truth, and a very few cases of actual real ground truth. Um, and so we can, we can kind of tell based on those how well we're doing, at least in an approximate way. Uh, but how do you know it worked on your own data? And again- Marius, before you get, uh, before you sort of switch topics to that, maybe um, there are a couple of questions here that might be worth yeah. addressing. Um, there are two about sampling rate. One of them is what is the minimum sampling frequency for template matching to work well enough? The other is, um, do you ever use a lower sampling rate like 10 or 20 kilohertz? And does, it give worse results. Um, on the other hand, did you think about upsampling the data um, even from 30 kilohertz? And do you think this would improve template matching and residuals that remain because spikes and templates will have a higher resolution in time? Yeah, okay, good questions. Let me answer the last one first. Um, is 30 kilohertz, you know, uh, fine enough? I think it, it definitely is fine enough for most things. Um, you can do this, um, super resolution sampling, but you don't necessarily have to do it at the level of the raw data to oversample the raw data. Uh, you can also kind of adjust your template so that you can pick up um, essentially what, what would the data look like if the template was, if the peak of the template, let's say, was kind of in between uh, two temporal samples. So you can do tricks of that sort. We've, we've tried some, um, there's some, there's some other, um, pieces of evidence from, from, from other people that this can help in some cases. We, we haven't really found that it helped for neuropixels uh, sorting. In terms of uh, if you have um, too little sampling that, you know, you only sample your, your waveforms every, you know, 10 kilohertz, I guess, would be three times less than um, neuropixels. You know, it's, it, of course, your your ability to tell spikes apart will decrease. There's no question about that. Exactly how quickly it decreases, that I think, I don't know, it's an empirical question. Um, it's still the case that your best chance at spike sorting under sampled data is to use as much information from the waveform as you have. And that's the, again, another important property of template matching is it uses, you know, not just where the peak of the spike is. It doesn't just look at threshold crossing to see where the spike got biggest. It uses all these other additional features about you know, exactly how the, the spike relaxes back differentially or, or you know, on different channels. That, that entire shape is being used to multiply with the raw data to tell us if, if that spike happened there or not. 
And so in that sense, whether you have more sampling or less sampling, your, your best uh, use of the data, your best use of the information is to use the full spatial temporal shape of the, of the template. All right, moving on. Um, Maybe one okay. more question. <laughs> yeah, about bursts. Uh, are there some specific parameters that would help to detect bursts better? Uh, you know, bursts are, so when people talk about bursts, the problem usually isn't that the spikes are overlapping from a burst because spike waveforms are, are pretty narrow, you know, one milliseconds and, and it, it's, it's relaxed. And bursts cannot happen more quickly than one millisecond or so either. So usually there, there won't be a lot of overlap in bursts. However, um, some people worry that when a neuron bursts, the amplitude of that spike on you know the second spike, third spike, fourth spike, and so on can get reduced. Kind of the, the cell is you know losing its its uh, its power. And I think there are examples of that. It's not the norm, I would say. Um, you'd have to look pretty carefully at data from specific brain areas like the hippocampus to find those kinds of examples. Um, in that case, you know, it's still, Kilosort has an amplitude modulation. It will be able to find that second spike in a burst by kind of reducing its, its amplitude. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I don't think, some, some other frameworks have special kind of cases for bursts, uh, but I don't really think they, they help much. I have yet to see it is very hard, at least from the neuropixels recordings I've seen, to even isolate uh, clear examples of, of burst amplitude reduction. So I'll, I'll leave that as a kind of a smaller problem that might be good to solve sometimes, but it's, it's, um, it's a special case. All right, thank you. Um, Right, so you know you'll be. I don't need to to spend a lot of time on, on these kinds of plots. These are taken straight from Phi. It's something that Nick will will show you a lot of, um, just to kind of already get you thinking about it. You know, you you need to know how well it's going to work on your own data, not on other people's data, ground truth data, whatever. Um, and so to do that, you'll be looking at things like the autocorrelogram. So that's what I wanted to introduce here. On the diagonal of this plot, you're seeing autocorrelograms from something like 10 units uh, that have the waveforms on the right. So you can see these are all pretty much in the same place and space, but they can be distinguished according to kind of different features and, and different channels that they're, that they're large on. And you'll know it worked well when you see kind of clean autocorrelograms with uh, not a lot of refractory periods. Uh, violations with basically with zero refractory period violations. That's one of your best signs that that things are working well. Um, there's many other things you'll 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 be looking at, but um, if you see a clean uh, autocorrelogram, you will know that you're kind of on the right path. These other things off the diagonal are cross correlogram between different neuron spikes. So that will tell you if there are different clusters that um, let's say complemented each other um, or that kind of if if there's a dip in an off diagonal plot uh, it means one neuron spikes are avoiding another neuron spikes uh, and that's very hard to get from real physiological processes it's more likely the spike sorting didn't work and so at least for some of these kind of base measures that you can quickly take a look at in in phi um, you know Amplitude fluctuations. So here's a screenshot from Phi. Shows you waveforms on the right. Shows you amplitude fluctuations. Shows you feature fluctuations. Um, once you get pretty good at interpreting these kinds of plots, um, that's really when you want to start thinking about going back and forth between the spikes order and whatever parameters you want to tune um, and uh, looking at its results and evaluating the results for yourself. Um, that's the kind of advanced way in which you can use uh, a spike sorter. Um, you can also just use it as a, as a black box, just you know, trust whatever it, it gives you. But I think if you do that, you'll be missing out on a chance to really improve the quality of your uh, own data. Here's another example. I like to show these because these are neurons that you know, are tracked well over time even though you can see there's dramatic changes in its kind of amplitude um, and features over channels. 
Now, those are kind of anticipating the last subject of, of my talk, which is drift. Um, the fact that the probe is moving up and down, and as a consequence, the amplitude of, of such spikes can change. All right, uh, so those are the easy cases, you know, but what do you do when you have something like really complicated like this, where you've got these neurons amplitudes kind of um, moving in, in, in sync with each other, and you can barely find directions in which uh, the clusters are separated, and there's, you know, there's a lot of spread along the direction of separation of these two clusters. The neuron, the spike waveforms are very similar. Um, you know, that's where uh, things are going to get difficult. Uh, and for sure, that's going to happen. There's always at least a few cases in any recording where there, there's something strange happening. And um, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll learn how to interpret those uh, as well with, with enough practice. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to, you know, exactly what you have to do to, to understand how to curate in phi the results of kilosort. That's, that's what Nick will tell you about. He'll probably tell you something like, you know, pick one of your data sets, spend a lot of time with, learn the main features to look for in phi, become a, a, a proficient phi user. But what I want to add to these is, you know, once you are, um, once you're comfortable with, with those two, um, now you should really try to go back and try to change the algorithm as well. Uh, try to adjust parameters. Um, hopefully, in a, you know, it, there's always a bit of a trial and error kind of process, but there's also some, if you know how the algorithm works, you'll, you'll know better which parameters to try changing. And of course, stay up to date with the algorithms because uh, this entire spike sorting field is, is moving fast. Um, and we're even, uh, we are ourselves releasing new versions of Kilosort um, fairly often now. So we get to Kilosort 2, which I told you the main feature is drift tracking. Um, it is a feature that was made obsolete just recently by our moving to a drift correction approach. So I'm not really going to tell you much about it. Uh, there's a few other features there that, that help with the spike sorting. Um, I told you it's the, the fact that the clustering can have these local minima problems. So we need to be careful and mindful about the initialization and then try to fix errors as we go throughout the optimization. Now the initialization is actually kind of, of an interesting development here in QLSR2 because we realized, and this is something that people were reporting to us all the time. Um, you know, if we look at the raw data and if you look at the data after you subtract off templates, you can sometimes see that there are spikes left that were not accounted for by, by templates. They're, they're missed spikes in the residual of the recording. And so the thing that we can do in the algorithm that, that we, we did, we added to the algorithm, was to initialize new templates based on this residual. So essentially we run a spike sorting, like a simple uh, spike um, detector. We run a simple spike detector on this residual and anything that kind of still crosses a, a threshold in the spike detector, we introduce as a new template. And this results in a kind of, you know, the set of templates expands pretty quickly. We also drop templates that are become unused. And so there's a kind of a continuous uh, churning of, of, of new templates being added and being dropped uh, until you know, there is very little left in this residual that we've accounted for uh, all the spikes in there. So that's what we did. You know, we call this a, a triaging operation. We triage the templates. Um, yeah, and, and this isn't really a problem anymore. It was a problem at the time um, in Kilosort 1. So we kind of, we had to, um, you know, really crank up our GPU too to be able to do this iterative kind of fitting of templates and, and subtraction all the time throughout the optimization. Uh, but luckily, GPUs have been getting faster, so Kilosort 2 doesn't runs just as fast as Kilosort 1 if you have a you know a newer and better GPU. Um, so some of these post-processing steps um, have to do with either merging neurons. So there might be situations like this. And again, these pictures are taken straight from, from phi. So this is what a human curator might see as the result of the algorithm. And so if we can kind of 
quantify that into an algorithm, we can fix problems uh, before they happen, right? So that um, the uh, human creator doesn't have to, to fix them. In particular, problems like the one on the right, where you can see it's really one cloud of spikes in these template projections, uh, that it's been split um, poorly into a red and a blue cluster. And so if we can detect that there's a continuous distribution across the splitting boundary, uh, then we are safe to merge them. Um, and there's there's a step of that sort that um, happens throughout the optimization in KiloSort. And there's the opposite split step to that too. Uh, like imagine that this blue and red clusters were, um, you know, incorrectly merged. Let's say that these were all blue spikes. Um, then one thing you could do is you could try to find a direction within this cluster or a line that you can draw within this cluster such that kind of the, the projection of the spikes across this line, you know, or orthogonal to it makes a bimodal distribution. So basically, if you see a bimodal distribution anywhere, you can be pretty sure that that's a valid split. And, you know, this is a very bimodal distribution. Uh, now you need an algorithm to find these directions in the first place. Uh, and so we developed such an algorithm it's called by modality pursuit. Um, you can see here 20 different examples. Um, and you can see, you know, some, some splits are more obvious than others because the kind of the dip goes almost all the way down to zero. But in others, you know, you have to accept some amount of cross contamination because there is no one direction that perfectly separates, let's say, the red and blue spikes. Um, in this case, there is, but you might very well imagine if, if there's enough overlap between those two, uh, you'll have to accept some amount of, of losses, of overlaps. And so we can quantify that um, by kind of fitting two Gaussians to each of these little plots and essentially quantifying um, how many uh, correct assignments we're going to have um, for spikes coming from those two Gaussians uh, in other words, we're calculating something like the area under the curve for a classification problem that looks at the overlap of those two Gaussians. Um, and that is somewhere where you can have a, a choice into how much uh, overlap you're, you're willing to accept. It's one of the parameters that we let users control uh, this area under the curve um, to split units more or less. All right, so in the final you know, 15, 20 minutes of this, uh, I'm going to talk about drift and how we correct for it. Um, drift is something that you first see in the amplitudes of your neurons over time, how those fluctuate. Now, this isn't the full extent of the problem. The problem isn't that the amplitude is changing. Uh, that's just a symptom of the problem. The problem is that your entire spikes are moving up and down on the probe and essentially changing their shape as, as the shape gets translated up and down. And so a single template that's fixed in space on the probe will not be able to account for this, this kind of vertical movement. Uh, it's pretty easy to see this kind of drift um, in, in what we call these drift plots. Um, I actually found a pretty old one that, that uh, we were doing a while ago. Um, what you have to kind of trace here with your eyes and actually I'm gonna trace it with an algorithm, is, is how much it looks like these spikes rasters are, are moving up and down. Um, and every spike here is colored. You know, darkness means how big its amplitude is. Darker spikes mean they have bigger amplitudes. Um, and so if you're kind of tracking lines through these kinds of plots, you can get a sense of when drift happens uh, and how much it's moving. Now, I should specify that, you know, this is something that we're looking at these plots early on, uh, and we thought that this was, as far as processing goes, uh, we were very worried about now interpolating the data up and down to correct for this drift, which is what you'd have to do. If you detect the drift, now you need to reinterpolate the data to kind of stabilize it. It's essentially a registration operation for those of you familiar with image registration. And so it turns out that, you know, we had a, a, a chance to kind of, I think, achieve a, a better solution earlier on. Uh, but instead, we got very worried about these kinds of small spikes 
that you might see only on a single channel. And you can see when, when single channel spikes on, on Neopixels 1 move up and down due to drift, they're going to change their shape. They might even disappear in between sites if you don't have a, a dense enough sampling. And so because of that, um, the initial approach in, in Kilosort 2, oh, there you go, was a tracking approach um, where we took a waveform and we tracked it across time, kind of changing the shape of the waveform as we, as we went through time. Uh, essentially doing this optimization algorithm in a kind of a closed loop, um, always readjusting the shapes of the templates uh, as the probe is drifting up and down. Uh, and that actually worked pretty well for a while. Um, here's some quantification of it, just showing you in Kilosort 2, you've got these two units that are drifting together up and down, and you're able to distinguish them from each other because you're, you're tracking the means of these clusters through time. Uh, whereas with Kilosort 1, we didn't have that, so everything got split into multiple pieces, uh, and it was uh, a user would have to uh, combine these pieces back together. Um, but one of the things, okay, let me skip through that and that, you know, it, it, it really did work better. I mean, we had simulations of, of, of drift uh, and it was clear from the simulations here at the bottom that Kilosort 2 was doing something that, you know, the, the best previous algorithms were really not able to do, it was able to, to track drift and, and, and correct for it. Um, but we noticed that especially for very long recordings, um, we still had a problem. Tracking, the, the act of tracking a waveform was uh, susceptible to these kinds of catastrophic failures that tracking can kind of stop abruptly, abruptly at some point. Here you see some, some neurons, let's say the yellow one, you can see the tracking stops abruptly at both ends in effect. So the tracking started somewhere in the middle here and it just kind of stopped abruptly. And when you have a failure in your tracking, it's very difficult to kind of get back on track because the world is changing, right? The, the other spikes are moving around, um, everything is moving up and down. Uh, it's very difficult to come back and re-identify the same neuron after some unknown process has changed the shape of all the other neurons. And so that became more clear as we worked with, with different people's data, um, in, including uh, some people at Genial that I've worked with uh, but also from other reports, uh, it was clear that that was one of the main failure modes of Kilosort 2. Uh, and so we took more of a registration approach. Um, in, in my lab, we're also very uh, close to um, the development of um, calcium imaging analysis methods. Uh, C2P is, is the framework that we maintain. And so we have quite a bit of, of experience with kind of registering images. And so what if we could uh, take these kinds of image registration approaches? I'm, I'm not gonna go over how these work for calcium imaging, we're running out of time. But what if we could, you know, it's easy to register an image. It's a big, cause it's big. It's 512 pixels by 512 or something like that. And so if it moves left, right, up, down, it, it's very easy to detect where it's moved because you see a lot of, a lot of the pixels. Uh, now with neuropixels, that's a little more difficult because you have, you have very few pixels. Um, and in particular, you, you have almost no resolution horizontally. So we'll not attempt to correct for anything horizontally, just vertically. Uh, and that's probably fine since most of what we expect is, is vertical drift. Uh, still, it's, it's an issue to take into account. The features that we have for registration uh, are kind of features of the spikes. They're not as stable as what you might have in, in an image of neurons where there's kind of always some background GCAMP, there's some blood vessels. It's kind of, it's easy to track things and, and, and correct for them. Uh, it's harder with um, EFES. And like in Neuropixels 1.0, you might have some kind of uh, funky geometry to deal with, um, not as easy as it would be to deal with a uniform grid. Now, luckily Neuropixels 2.0 has a nice grid that is, that is just simply two columns, uh, makes it a lot easier for, for drift correction. And as you'll see, in fact, it does improve the results of, of drift correction. 
Um, because we're Neuropathos 2.0 samples more densely uh, vertically, um, you get these spikes that are, are great for interpolation if you need to move them up and down. And uh, indeed, we can look at these kinds of drift plots um, and develop automated algorithms that can track the drift. Here, there's actually some superimposed drift that Nick um, added to one of his experiments to provide for kind of ground truth data that we might uh, benchmark the algorithm against. So he was literally just moving the manipulator up and down. I'm gonna skip over the details of how this works. You can, uh, you'll be able to find those details hopefully soon into the, the updated Kilosor 2.5. But here's what the estimated shifts look like. So this is just going from the raw data. We're able to determine this kind of sine wave um, manipulator movement that, that was imposed. And outside of that region, you can also see some of the natural movement that happened uh, to the brain during you know, periods before and after. Some of these are kind of periods of slower drift. Some of them are, are sharper drift, corresponding perhaps to physical events like, like animals' behavior. I'm gonna skip through exactly how we interpolate the data back, but it's clearly it's gonna be important, especially for these checkerboard geometries to think about you know, how we're going to determine you know, what is the voltage at this uh, orange square if I know the voltage at the blue squares, because that's what I would need if I was to shift the data up and down. And so we use specialized interpolation methods for that. Um, here's what the original data looked like. Here it is after rigid registration. So where all of the data is moved up and down by the same amount, uh, regardless of what position you're at on the probe. Uh, you can see that there's some remaining drift, especially at the top of the probe here, right? There's some drift left where some of these bands are still moving up and down, whereas the bottom, you know, seems pretty stable. That tells us that there's kind of differential movement at the top and bottom of the probe um, that we kind of need to correct for separately. Uh, and again, that's, that's something very typical that you would do with image registration methods for, for calcium imaging. Uh, it's called non-rigid registration. And so the way you fix that is you break Myers, your probe. Yeah. Just a quick note, you have about four minutes. Got it. Lots of questions also, if you want to. <laughs> All right, I will stop in four minutes. Um, the, this is, you know, the most advanced part of this is this non-rigid registration where we correct separately for different portions on the probe. You can see we can get different traces of correction, oops, at, at different parts on the probe. And so now we can kind of use the differential movement, you know, in a smart way to correct uh, for non-rigid registration. Uh, and now we've got kind of stable spikes throughout the entire plot, both at the top and, and at the bottom of it. All right, let me skip through that. We've got some benchmarks to show that, you know, the stabilization is, is greatly helping as far as kind of you know, it's correlation with this manipulator movement. So original, lots of correlation of all neurons. After stabilization, it's pretty close to what you'd expect by chance. We get more stable units this way. After stabilization, the stable units go down, the unstable units go up, unstable units go down. So again, uh, it, it greatly helps. Uh, and if you look back at some of these long recordings, now we're kind of tracking them more continuously, uh, even though you see there, there's a lot of, of change in these waveforms. All right, the final thing I, I don't have time to talk about, but um, it's a fairly new thing. It's pretty easy to understand. It's really just uh, a way to kind of skip this human step of calling a unit good MUA noise. Um, we can use automated cloud algorithms for that uh, based on both the waveform the spatiotemporal waveform of every little spike here. We can put that through a neural network like this. We can combine that with another neural network that looks at the autocorrelogram. Uh, and we can train the neural network to give us our best predictions of um, what is a good or a good shape of a neuron uh, or unit and, and what is noise. Uh, and it gets us on this data set, again, a data set collected by Nick Steinmetz and, and manually created by him, 
uh, we get to a 92% accuracy or so, uh, which is pretty good. All right, so these are the Kilosort modules. Um, I've told you about some of these core modules that have to do with clustering and template matching. Those have stayed mostly unchanged, uh, and I think they will continue to. Um, I've told you about some of the newer improvements in drift corrections, uh, and I've touched at the end on, uh, on these unit classifiers that are meant to you know, reduce, reduce further some of the, the manual steps you'd have to do uh, in a GUI. I just wanted uh, you know, um, thank my collaborators uh, as well as uh, Janelia for uh, everything. And now I'll take questions for about five to 10 minutes at most. Sorry, I had to unmute. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, we have loads of questions. I'm just picking a few. So uh, what happens if a neuron stops firing for a while? Um, will the template be dropped or how is it handled? Um, depends how for how long it stops firing. If it stops firing for hours, you know, or like yeah. tens of minutes, then the template might get dropped. Actually, no, sorry, let me, the answer depends on which version of Kilosort you're using. As I said, we're going to release this new version very soon, 2.5, which no longer cares about uh, time so much because it has this pre-registration step, this drift correction step that fixes the non-stationary across time, mostly fixes it. And in fact, after that, we kind of randomize the order of the batches. And so those kinds of problems with, with dropping templates will not happen anymore. Uh, it will be tracked just fine, even over very long periods of time. All right, okay. next question. Um, is it possible to use KiloSort to sort data acquired with lower density probes? And how do the results vary with different uh, site configurations? Yeah, so again, I think the answer is one I've, I've given before. If Even if you have lower density probes, your best bet at spike sorting is to take full advantage of the spatial temporal shape of, of the waveform. Um, and so, you know, if you have less information there, then yes, you'll be, you'll be doing more poorly. Uh, but it will still be the case that, you know, the best way to take advantage of the information is to use, you know, the multi-channel uh, waveforms. Uh, and people do, they even use it with uh, single electrodes uh, or like with Utah arrays where the electrodes are uh, very far spaced apart. Uh, you just shouldn't expect the quality of clustering to be as good or the quality of isolation between clusters to be as good. Mm -hmm. mm, there are several questions about uh, how many sites uh, KiloSort can deal with. Can you say like how does it upscale? Like, uh, Yeah, I mean right now it's limited in software to about a thousand or so sites. Um, the only probes that have more than that are probably some of these retinal arrays that go up to 4,000 or something. Um, it's not a, a hard um, limit in the sense that it could be relaxed with a little bit more work to manage memory and stuff like that, fairly kind of low level uh, stuff, but uh, we haven't really seen any good reasons to uh, so far. Cool, maybe last question. Um, are there parameters you would recommend to fine tune in order to reduce oversplitting of units? Right. So, oversplitting can happen for, I think, two reasons, but they're probably both the same reason. Uh, often happens because a neuron can look different depending on, you know, exactly when it was recorded, right? So, like if there's drift, the neuron can look different when it drifts up versus when it drifts down. And so then an algorithm might, might split that neuron. Now with drift correction, the, the, the data gets kind of more into register. The sampling of the channels is still, you know, not fine enough. Perhaps it is with Neuropixels 2.0, but certainly not with 1.0. It's not fine enough that when you kind of move a template down uh, it looks exactly the way it would have looked if it happened uh, over there. So there'll be some changes across channels and that can result in more splits. And so 
I think the first step there would be to make sure the drift correction works very well. If it, if it works poorly for your data, you might want to mess with some parameters in drift correction until you get it looking reasonably. Um, and so once you get that out of the way and you still have splits, um, then you can start uh, playing with um, this, um, you know, area under the curve parameter I told you about. You know, there's one parameter specifically for controlling splits. It's specifically for controlling how much overlap. I'm going to find the picture, I promise. There. So it's specifically for controlling how much overlap you are okay with. Um, if you think, for example, you might think that this unit over here is really a single unit, but maybe it's kind of like drifted to two different positions, um, then you would uh, essentially increase your, you know, how much you, you allow the overlaps to happen before a neuron gets split. And that's one specific parameter in, in the GUI even.